How's everybody doing? You guys were the ones that slid on into church this morning, right? <laughs> it was slick out there. I was uh, out at, I think I left to go on a call. I work, I drive a tow truck, so I was out at 11.20. I don't think I got home till 3 something, so I'm working on a couple hours of sleep and a couple cans of Red Bull here. So if I start talking too fast, just yell out, slow down, okay? So... This morning, we're going to be in Mark chapter 6. We're going to pick up right where Jim left off. Mark chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 30. Do you know what the difference between a test and a temptation is? It's in the tester's motivations and expectations and perspective, yes. The devil tempts so that the believer might fail God's standards of faith and fall into sin. God, on the other hand, tests that he might prove and sharpen true faith with no intention of ever making the believer fail. In this life, we will face both. Times of testing, times of temptation, and the outcome is totally dependent upon us. What, all, what it ultimately comes down to is faith and reliance on God or reliance on ourself. You see, if we rely on our own strength and wisdom... We'll fail the test every time. We'll be tempted to fall into sin. But if our faith is in God, we can trust Him. We can rely on His promise to cause everything to work together for the good of those who love Him. Amen? So, though failure, when being tested, doesn't always lead to direct outright sin, often the test was to see how much we truly t trust God. When testing and temptations do come, we trust, do we trust God or we do, do we trust ourselves? This morning in our study, we're going to see the disciples face two tests. Though they were tempted to sin this time, though they weren't tempted to sin this time, they did sadly miss the point of the test. And they failed to learn immediately what God was trying to teach them. But the neat thing is, we get to see you know, that in both tests, Jesus revealing to them more of the mystery of his calling and the mission and proving his deity to them. So Mark chapter 6, start in verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him that all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they didn't even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all of the towns and got there ahead of them. So back in verse 7, we saw that Jesus had sent them out two by two on mission. And he gave them power and authority to cast out demons and heal disease. They were to preach to everyone about the kingdom of God. And so now they've started to return. And they're going to attempt to give Jesus a report. Have you ever gone on a missions trip or a church camp or a church retreat type of thing? It's kind of what these guys were experiencing right here. They, Jesus sends these guys out and they have an intense time of experiencing God, work in and through their lives. And, and, and now they come back and they're kind of on this spiritual high. They're excited. They're, they're going to tell Jesus what had happened. And, and as they attempt to tell Jesus all that happened, there were many distractions. And Mark feels that it was important enough to tell us it was so chaotic that they didn't even get a chance to eat. Do you ever get distracted when trying to serve God? or spend some time reading or studying the Bible. That's kind of what the disciples were going through here. They're on this spiritual high coming back from this missions trip, and they get distractions. And then to add insult to injury, because so many people were coming and going, they don't even have a chance to eat, which I don't know about you, but when I don't get a chance to eat, I kind of get hangry. <laughs> and what happens when we get hangry? We... we become irritated or impatient. We lose our cool, right? So they had just come down from this mountaintop experience, 
They had been used by God, and now their faith is being tested. That seems to be how it goes, though, right? You come down from this mountaintop experience, and all of a sudden you get tested. You have an awesome time in the Word, and somebody cuts you off in traffic. You, you enjoy a, a good sermon at church, and you leave, and somebody calls you on the phone and says, hey, we need you to come in. We, this, everything went, went south. You know, you get tested. Last night, I'm laying in bed, getting ready for bed. I knew I was preaching this morning, and my phone goes off. And I step outside, and it is icy. It was really icy at 11. And I was complaining. I was not happy. I'll be honest with you guys. I was complaining a little. Like, I am scared to drive on ice. I'll admit that to you. I'm scared to drive on ice in a 7,000 or 7 ton truck, more like a sled on ice. It's scary. And so I was complaining a little. I, uh, I had a little test of my own last night. But after that mountaintop experience, after that time in the Word, you get tested, right? That's usually how it goes. And the disciples don't know it yet, but they're about to walk into a time of testing. So because of the crowds, Jesus said, let us get away. Let us get to a quiet place and rest a while. Kind of like the quiet before the storm, if you will. So they went away. But those who saw them leaving ran ahead on foot. This is an interesting detail. They ran ahead on foot. Mark tells us that this, it's, it's almost as if he wants us to get something by this. Because some of the elderly, some women and children, some sick, especially some lame and blind, would not be able to run after him. So it seems that only a certain portion of the crowd was able to run after him and able to get ahead to where they meet them before the, the disciples land, uh, you know, go ashore. But it, it kind of gives us some insight into the eagerness and the makeup of the crowd. And, and, but Mark tells us that they, they ran ahead on foot so much for a quiet time and dinner, right? Verse 34, Jesus landed and saw a large crowd. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Jesus saw this crowd, and he had compassion on them. He sees people without direction, without purpose, without a leader, and he begins to teach them. He had compassion on them, which... If you're a hangry disciple, this wasn't what you wanted to do right now. You were expecting dinner and relaxation, and now all of a sudden Jesus stops everything to teach these people. God once told Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will show compassion on whom I want to show compassion. Though this wasn't in the disciples' plans, this seems to be in God's plans. Ironically, there's no mention of the group of scribes and Pharisees that normally followed Jesus around. And I wonder if that's because they are supposed to be the leaders. They are supposed to be the teachers. And they're missing from this equation. But Jesus sees this crowd and he has compassion on them uh, because Mark tells us they were like sheep without a shepherd. The description of this crowd is obviously a metaphor for the lack of care and leadership. Kinda, it's kind of the same description used in the Old Testament for Israel in the wilderness when Moses was about to pass off the scene. See, when Moses was about to, to pass away, he asks God, who's going to succeed? Who's going to take over? Who's going to lead these people? And in Numbers 27, we read, Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and to come in before them one who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. The Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom the spirit of leadership, lay your hand on him, have him stand before the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. When Moses was ready to pass off the scene, God says, I've got somebody ready to go. Because God did not want Israel to be like sheep without a shepherd. In the Proverbs, it tells us, why, without wise leadership, a nation falls. 
There is safety in having advisors. And with this crowd, where were the teachers? Where were the spiritual leaders? Where were the rabbis? And I'll be honest with you. This is what America is coming to. This is what post-Christian nations have become. Sheep without shepherd. People carried away by every wind of doctrine. Because that's what steps in when leaders step out. Every wind of doctrine to tickle people's ears. That's what, that's what comes in. People will follow after anything without a leader. And that is why here at Calvary Chapel Eastside, we are dedicated to faithful preaching and teaching of God's Word. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, week in and week out. Let me tell you, there are crowds and crowds of people that are our neighbors, our friends, and our family, our co-workers right now that are wandering like sheep without shepherds. We know who they are. Does that bother you? It bothers me. My heart breaks when I see the masses being led astray by Hollywood and social media, right? It breaks my heart to know that some of the people that I dearly love have rejected Jesus. May we have the heart of Jesus and be moved with compassion for these people to actually do something. Our neighbors, our friends, our family are this crowd like sheep without a shepherd. Now the disciples were getting ready, they're getting ready, they're getting ready to eat. They wanted food. They were getting hungry, hangry at this point because in verse 35 they asked Jesus to just send away the crowd. Verse 35, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Imagine it went something like this. Jesus, hey, hey, we're getting a little hungry. Can't, can't you just send them away? Isn't it time for them to go home? I mean, we're supposed to get away alone, remember? Uh, we're supposed to have dinner, not entertain a crowd. Can't you send them away to fend for themselves, is what they said. Isn't this the crowd that, Je that Mark just described as sheep without a shepherd? Jesus was the only one who had compassion for these people. Because the disciples just wanted the distraction to go away. Verse 37, but he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread? And give it to them to eat? They asked Jesus to send this crowd away because it's getting late. And the people are probably getting hungry. To which Jesus required, re replied, you give them something to eat. Here's the first test of their faith. Jesus commands them to do something. Are they going to obey? Or are they going to balk about it? They start off with the standard excuses. It's too much money. Are you suggesting we spend that much money on bread? And just give it to them? The magnitude of the problem seems too great for the disciples. Too much for them to handle. Too big for God, maybe. Moses encountered kind of a similar situation. Moses thought it was impossible to feed all of the Israelites in the, in the wilderness. Moses speaking to God, he goes, where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I can't carry all these people by myself. Sound familiar? The burden is too heavy for me. That would cost too much. Would they have enough if the flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? Moses is looking out at two, three million people, and he's wondering, how, how am I supposed to feed these people? Moses, like the disciples, was like, what do you expect me to do? And God's response to Moses is telling kind of what Jesus is about to do. The Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. This is what Jesus is about to do. The disciples totally disregard anything supernatural and only look at the, what they can or can't do. They only think about what they're willing to do. 
The disciples don't see why this is their responsibility. Even if they had enough money, enough bread, why should they spend it on these people? So not only did they lack the faith to see how it could have been done, they missed out on why it should have been done. So seeing the response of the disciples, Jesus takes charge in verse 38. How many loaves do you have? He asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to all the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. Jesus said, you feed them. And when they said they couldn't, Jesus said, well, what do you have? John, in his, in his gospel, tells us that Jesus asked Philip to find out what food they had. Probably after all the other disciples were digging through their pockets, counting their pennies. But John also tells us that Andrew brings forward a, a young boy with five barley loaves and two fishes. That's where we get that story of the, the boy with the five loaves and two fishes. But Mark kind of leaves them details out. He's more focused on the response of the disciples and the actions of Jesus here. But the disciples' lack of faith lead them to complain about what they didn't have. Jesus, see pos Jesus sees possibilities where the disciples only see impossibilities. What Jesus is illustrating here is that God can do anything. The writer of the Hebrews reminds us that without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The disciples failed their test. But Jesus, looking up to heaven, gives thanks and, and broke the bread and the, divided the two fish. If you were Jewish and the head of a family at a meal, this is how you would start your meals. By taking the bread, pronouncing the blessing, breaking it, and distributing it. Jesus is acting as a father here. But instead of running out of the loaves and fish, they multiplied as he divided them. We're not told how this actually looked, but this is the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. So it must have left an impression on their minds. But unfortunately, the disciples did not pass their test of faith. And to prove it, verse 42, then they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten them was 5,000. They all ate and were satisfied. This wasn't just a snack. They ate and they had their fill. And even the disciples got to eat. And afterward, the disciples gathered 12 baskets, one for each of them as a reminder of what God can do when we trust him, right? The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Mark does not mention women and children. We, we assume there was some there because uh, the young boy with the five loaves and the two fish. But remember, this crowd is mainly made up of those who ran there to meet him. And they all, including the disciples, ate and were satisfied. And then immediately afterwards, verse 45 Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went onto the mountainside to pray. This seems weird. Jesus immediately shoves his disciples into the boats and he dismisses the crowd and he goes off to pray by himself. John, in his account, writes, Jesus, knowing that they had intended to come and make him king by force, he withdrew himself. That gives us a little insight into this. This wouldn't make sense why he'd send the disciples away, except when we go to John's gospel, we read that Jesus knew that they intended to take him as king and make him their king. And so he didn't want his disciples to get caught up in this mob mentality, so he sends them away. Because of the miracles of the feeding of the 5,000, the, the crowds have become so excited they wanted to take Jesus and make him their king right then and there. They wanted to start a revolution against 
a Roman government. But it wasn't his time. Nor did Jesus come to be king at this point. Jesus came to die a sacrificial death. Nobody seemed to understand this at this point. He came to die a sacrificial death for the sins of the whole world so that all who believe in him could be forgiven and reconciled to God. Yes, one day God, Jesus will return as the conquering king, but this wasn't his time. This wasn't God's plan. So he ushers the disciples into a boat and dismissed the crowds. After leaving them, he went on the mountain to pray. The mention of prayer in this context is a further clue that they wanted to take Jesus by force and make him their king because Mark only mentions Jesus praying three specific times in his entire gospel. The first, in Mark 1.35, it says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. This was when he began his earthly ministry. He began healing people and casting out demons, and all of a sudden crowds started gathering around. The second is here in this chapter, Mark 6, 45, where this crowd wanted to take Jesus by force and make him their king. And the third, interesting enough, the third is in Mark 14, 35. It says, Jesus prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not I will, but what you will. This was in the Garden of Gethsemane right before his arrest. Each of these prayers that Mark records for us have several things in common. Jesus prays when it's dark out and in a lonely place. And each time he is alone, the disciples are not with him, probably because they are failing to understand his mission. And in each Of these, Jesus faces a major decision or crisis. But in each and every time that he prayed, we see that Jesus never gives in to anything except for the will of God. What would happen if we prayed more? How different of an outcome would we see when we're facing temptations and troubles and trials if we would pray first? The disciples tried to rationalize in their minds and by their own power how to work things through. Jesus immediately goes away to pray. If Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? We need to train our minds that prayer should be our first and only response to temptations, to trials, and to troubles. It's not our will, but God's. So why not seek his direction first? Amen? Verse 47, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was, alone, he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when, he saw the, when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them, And said, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. So later that night, they're in the middle of the lake. Pay attention to that little detail there. The the boat wasn't stuck on some sandbar. It wasn't near the beach. It wasn't in a shallow section. It was in the middle of the lake. Generally, what's the deepest part of the lake? The middle of the lake, right? And Jesus looks out and he sees the disciples straining because the wind was against them. And he walks out on the water to them. This had to be supernatural. He wasn't walking on a sandbar or anything like that. It was supernatural. This is test number two for the disciples' faith. Jesus sends them off to the other side on the boat. They don't seem to be in any danger like the previous time when Jesus was asleep at the back of the boat. But it says that they were in the middle of the lake, probably because they were unable to make any progress because of the wind. But this word straining, interesting enough, means tormented. They were being tormented by the wind and the waves. We get no indication that this was demonic or anything. Rather, they were tormented by the force of the wind and the waves. Something natural. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. Sometimes the troubles of this life torment us, don't they? This wasn't anything other than the troubles of this life. And you know what? Jesus was the one that sent them out there. 
Ever feel this way? Trying to be obedient to God? Trying to obey? And it seems like you just got sent into a storm that torments you? If there was ever anyone in the Bible who could relate to this, it's Job in the Old Testament. He was doing, he's out there doing his own thing. We're told that he was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil, and yet God allowed Satan to torment Job. Why? Well, if you read the book of Job, it was to produce a greater faith in Job. Storms come to produce a greater faith in the one being tested. James in James chapter 1 writes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God allowed J- uh, Satan to test Job, and Jesus sent his disciples out on the boat to test them, to strengthen their faith in him. Ironically, throughout the Bible, we see that when the test is passed, the faith of the one being tested is always stronger. At the end of the book of Job, Job's faith in God was much stronger than in the beginning. The disciples' faith will grow through this. Though though it's going to take some time, they'll look back on this and it, it will have caused their faith to grow. But this is why James has the audacity to tell us, consider it pure joy when you face trials. In fact, uh, interesting enough, the, the word in James, translated there as trials, and later translated there as tempted, are the same word. The only difference is the outcome. Did you know the outcome is totally up to us? When we're tested, when we're tempted, there's a way out. Peter says in 1 Peter, in all of this, greatly rejoice, though now for a little while that you may have to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. God's intent is to grow our faith. God's intent was to grow their faith through these trials. How we pass or fail the test is up to us. Trials, troubles, and temptations all come to grow our faith and to prove the genuineness of our faith. If we don't give into the if we give into the temptation, we fail the test. When tested, pray. When troubles come, pray. When life torments you, pray. This is the example Jesus sets for us. Paul in 1 Corinthians says temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. So we all have to face uh, temptations. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so you can endure. How does God show us a way out? Pray. Pray that God will show you a way out so you can endure. How different would the outcome be if we prayed first when trials, troubles, and temptations come our way? Let me tell you, this morning, 2 a.m. or whatever time it was, I should have been praying rather than grumbling. I'll be honest with you guys. I should have been praying rather than grumbling. I, I was complaining about the ice. It was cold. It was, the wind was blowing. This car was not coming out of the... It was in a drainage ditch. She had managed to land 20 feet down, 200 feet off the road in a drainage ditch, and it was not coming out easy, and I was complaining... What would have happened differently, I'm looking back on this, if I would have been praying instead of complaining? But back to the second half of verse 48. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the water, and he was about to pass by them. Remember, they're in the middle of the lake, the deepest part, so there's no other explanation other than a supernatural act, a miraculous event. But it says that he was about to pass by them. I love this. 
if you never spend any time reading and studying through the Bible, you'll miss these little things that tie the entire Bible together. And this is one of them. Because they didn't have chapter and verse breaks, that's kind of a modern invention, they had to use phrases and words to associate to another passage. And what they would do is they would use a phrase like here, the, uh, he was about to pass by them. And in this instance, you would read that. If you were back in these days, you would read that and you'd be like, that reminds me of another passage. Mark writes that he was about to pass by them. Where have we heard that phrase before, pass by? In Exodus 33, we read that Moses asks God to show him his glory. Do you remember that section? He's like, God, show me your glory. And the Lord said to Moses, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Interesting that that's all in the same passage as well. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can, may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. God tells Moses, I will cause my goodness to pass by in front of you, but you cannot see my face and live. But when my glory passes by, I will protect you until I have passed by. You see, this wasn't simply Jesus racing them to the other side. In the midst of their torment, Jesus re was revealing to more of himself to them. He was showing them his glory as the one and only Son of God. That's what Jesus was doing here. In the book of Job, Job describes God as having the ability to do what humanity cannot or could never dream of doing. Job says his wisdom is beyond compare. He moves mountains, shakes the earth, obscures the sun, arrays the heavens in splendor, and he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. When he passes me, I cannot see him. When he goes by, I cannot perceive him. He alone stretches out the heaven and treads on the waves of the sea. Jesus walking on water, performing wonders they could have never imagined. It was only something God could do. And here Jesus is walking on waters, passing them by, proving to them his deity, that he is the one and only true Son of God. This was just for them. Nobody else got to witness this, just them. Jesus, right before their eyes, proved himself to be God. And their response? They were afraid. They think he's a ghost. But he says, take courage, it is I. Another one of those little phrases that tie everything together. This phrase, it is I, in the Greek is identical to when Moses asked God, who, who shall I say is sending me? And God says, I am. It's the exact same phrase. So in this passage, we see that Jesus not only walks where God can walk, but he also claims his name. Only to the disciples, though. We had a crowd that was ready to push Jesus into the forefront, push Jesus into a ministry. Jesus leaves to pray, and then God leads him to reveal more of himself to the disciples. And they're not passing this test real well. Mark tells us when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. Probably a little superstition left over from fisherman days. But they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. They all did. Quite literally, they cried out in a shriek of terror and screams of fright. Jesus takes off walking across the water. And side note, he was probably making better headway than they were. But these grown men, these muscular fishermen and, and carpenters and such, with all their muscles and all their might, they're rowing away. They look over, they see this, what they think is a ghost, and they are now screaming like little schoolgirls. They, they're afraid. Matthew, in telling his narrative, he adds the additional information that Peter requests Jesus that he can come out and walk on the water. 
Remember that story when Peter walks on the water going to, going to Jesus? But Mark leaves that out. Mark, who is writing this for Peter, leaves that out. Perhaps Peter was not fond of telling that. Because so, it was a failure of his faith. He looked away. He looked at the storm and the waves instead of looking to Jesus. But just because it le was left out doesn't mean there's a contradiction. Mark did not see it useful in moving forward the plot. So instead of passing by, Jesus meets them right where they are in verse 51. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Jesus tells them, don't be afraid, and then he climbs in the boat, and the wind dies down. Just like when Jesus was asleep in the boat during the storm, he stands up and commands the waves and the wind to be still, and they were. Jesus calms the storm. Wouldn't we love this if Jesus did this for us every time we were in a storm? I, I know I would. Every time. Hey, can you just calm the storm? I need a break, you know. But Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But he doesn't stop there. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In this life you have trouble. There will be trials. We will be tormented by things in this life. But take heart, Jesus has overcome this world. Consider it an opportunity for joy when trials come your way. You don't have to be afraid and scream like a little schoolgirl because Jesus has overcome the world. Here's the key to all this. When, whenever we see the disciples are separated from Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, they fall into distress. They lose trust in him and what he said to do. So if separation bring, from Jesus brings the disciples into distress, the opposite is true as well. Jesus' presence with them overcomes the storms in their lives. Jesus is the key. He has overcome the world. His presence will help us overcome the storms in our life. It may not calm it, but it will help overcome it. In fact, he promises to those who remain in me and I in them, they will produce much fruit. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. In this life, there will be storms and trials, but it's up to us whether or not we choose to face them alone. How many tests would we have passed is instead of fear and trembling, we remain close to Jesus? How many tests could we have passed if we prayed and trusted Jesus when he said, go and do this? How different my life would be if I had remained close to Jesus more often. Amen? Mark continues to tell us they were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When God was about to show Moses his glory, he said, I will have compassion and mercy on whom I will have compassion and mercy on. The disciples wanted the crowd sent away because their hearts were hardened, but Jesus had compassion on them speaking to the fact that God's ways are higher than our ways, his understanding higher than our understanding. This does not mean, though, that they were opposed to Jesus, but simply that they were slow to perceive what he was doing. They allowed the circumstances of their situation dictate their response instead of trusting Jesus. They should be beyond this stage of astonishment and amazement. They should be. But they're a little dense, much like some of us. And this goes to prove to us that faith is not the automatic result of knowing about Jesus or of even being with Jesus. Faith is not something that happens automatically. It's a personal decision or choice. It is more often than not a decision that must be made in the face of struggle and trials and temptations. A lack of faith is more dangerous than anything this world can throw at us. God was testing their faith in these times. They eventually learned the lesson. But it took a little while. Isn't that how we kind of are? I know I am. Sometimes it takes a little while to learn the lesson. Sometimes it takes a little while to get what God's trying to teach me because I'm a little dense sometimes. Verse 53. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret 
and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, the people recognized Jesus. They ran through that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or, co or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Immediately after anchoring, people recognized Jesus and they began to bring him sick. Helpless. Lame. They began to bring their friends and their family out to Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer. The disciples, they had a rough night. They got dinner late. They got sent out on a boat. They've been rowing for hours. And now here they are right back into ministry. Right back into the thick of it. And that happens for each and every one of us. We go from trial to testing to trial to testing. Maybe a little break to the mountaintop to trial to trust, testing. Why? Because without testing, our faith cannot be proven. Why do they test why, why are there tests and quizzes when you're in school? Because they're trying to see what you're learning. God's done the same thing with each and every one of us. Immediately they bring him the sick. The pri prophet Isaiah wrote this about the coming Messiah. Be strong and do not fear, for your God will come. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Jesus just continues to do what God sent him to do and what was prophesied that he would do. They came and they begged just to touch the edge of his garment. Where have we heard that story before? The woman with the issue of blood? She just, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I would be healed. These people had more faith than the disciples at this point. The disciples are a little dense. But these people had faith enough to believe that if they just touched the hem of his garment, they would be healed. But more importantly, like the woman with the issue of blood, it was their faith that healed them, not some superstition or touching the hem or some action. It's faith. When trials, troubles, and temptations come, pray. Pray. Just as Jesus had compassion on these crowds, he will have compassion on us as well. Pray. If you're struggling through a trouble or a trial or a temptation, pray. Trust Jesus. We started with the faith of disciples when they went out, when Jesus sent them out two by two. They came back and they were all excited because they saw people get healed. They, they taught the message and, and everything. And they were, they were on cloud nine. And when we ended, it was the faith of of those who know that they would be healed if they touched the edge of his garment that we see, not the faith of the disciples. But between those two events, there's a lot of failed tests and misunderstandings. But, Psalm 86, 15, But you, O Lord, are a merciful and gracious God slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God didn't just discard the disciples because of their lack of faith. Jesus wasn't like, you know what, you guys aren't getting this. I'm going to find some new people. Hey, these people have a lot of faith in me. I'm going to, I'm going to go get them. Jesus doesn't do that. He continues many more chapters dealing with the disciples' denseness and not getting it and stuff. Though failure when being tested doesn't always lead to direct outright sin, more often than not, the test was to see how much we truly trust God. When testing and temptations come, do we trust God or do we trust ourselves? It's all about faith and trust in God. Faith and trust in the promises and what we know about God. The Bible tells us that God is love. God loves each and every one of us. And a lot of times when we go through trials and temptations and troubles, 
We want to blame God for not loving us or think of God as unloving to allow us to go through that. But in the, the reality is that he is sending us through that to grow our faith. Is it Romans 8, 28? For God works all things together for those who love and trust him, for the good of those who love and trust him. God's working all things for our good because he loves us. He loved these disciples. He didn't just leave them out on the boat to keep paddling. He didn't just leave them hungry. He fed them. He's teaching them faith through the trials. And for each and every one of us, he's trying to teach us faith through the trials that we face. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we fail you so many times in trusting you and Lord, we look to our own understanding. We look to our own strength when, when in reality we should be looking to you. Lord, forgive us for those times where we, where we don't rely on you, where we rely on ourselves. Lord, forgive us for those times where we fail to trust that you will do what you said you'll do and will be who you said you are. Lord, we thank you that you love us, that you don't just leave us out there paddling on the boat. Lord, but you bring us in. You feed us. You, you comfort us. You want us to experience more of you. You reveal more of yourself through the trial, through the temptation. Lord, may we get that. Lord, like Jesus, may we learn to pray more often. May, we, may our instinct be to run to prayer instead of running to self. Lord, we thank you. We praise you that you never leave us. You never forsake us. And you're always wanting to work through us and in us. Lord, as we go from this place, Lord, may, we, may you grant us traveling mercies. Lord, it's a little slick. We just pray that you would keep us all safe. Lord, and for the trials that we face today, Lord, may we understand that you're working that to our good, to our benefit. Lord, thank you for everything you've done in and through our lives. Lord, we can't wait till the day we stand before you. And all this... All, all these things will pass away, and we get to see you face to face. Lord, we can't wait for that day. Lord, but we understand there's many people yet who need to come to know you. So, Lord, may we have compassion on those who don't know you. May we, may we step forward and do something. May, may you use us to reach our friends and our family and our coworkers and our neighbors so that they can come to know you as we know you. Lord, Lord we pray for the lost of the city. We pray for, Lord, I pray for each and every one here, Lord. I know there's a lot of things going on. Lord, I just pray that you would be working in and, each, in and through each and every person in this place. Lord, I thank you for these people. I thank you for their dedication to you. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen their faith today.